Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to give you a compilation of all of the most viewed episodes for 2022. One small note, the first video is about how and why narcissists cannot move on. It is not about how not moving on makes someone a narcissist. Lots of people have trouble moving on from lots of things for lots of reasons and this does not make a person narcissistic. A lot of the videos about this subject in general are simply lists of criteria for labeling people narcissists or they're about things that only narcissists do. The truth is narcissists have a lot of the same issues that other people have but the issues are turned up to an extreme unworkable level and sometimes they occur for different reasons. Context is really, really important here. Just because someone does something a narcissist does or has a similar problem doesn't make them a narcissist. We are all human and we have a lot of the same issues. It's really not black and white at all. It has a lot more to do with how people deal with things, the rigidity of their thinking, their mindsets, their perceptions, and a lot of other stuff. It's not as easy as just looking at lists of problems, behaviors, or words and being able to say that someone is 100% for sure a narcissist because they said or did these specific things. I wish it was. I wish it was that easy. That would be so much better, but it's not, and I wish more people understood that. It would cut down on the confusion, and there's already enough of that in these situations to begin with. With that out of the way, let me say I'm very grateful to share your journey with you, and it has been my pleasure to help in whatever small way I can. The best we can ever do is to take what we've learned and pay it forward, so it has been my honor to do that. Here's to learning what we could from the year that just passed and applying that to the year coming in. Here's to continuing to learn together. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about the narcissistic personality's inability to process and move on from things. This is something many people encounter when dealing with narcissists, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. You've probably noticed that narcissistic people have a hard time moving on from things. While they may exit the situation, they don't ever seem to move on from it. They don't seem to process things or accept them or come to terms with them so they can be at peace. It's more of an escape from things than anything else. For example, years after they had a bad experience at a job or with a relationship, they may continue to talk about it as if it just happened recently. All the emotion about the situation is still there. They will often still say the same things, feel the same ways, have the same conclusions. There may be no growth or expanding of perspective at all. If it involves the narcissist experiencing negative emotions, they simply cannot see or hear anything past that. This is why we always recommend not getting caught in a cycle of explaining yourself to narcissists. It doesn't work. It is extremely difficult to deal with someone who cannot move on from things. It ends with people being harassed and punished and just tortured over things for years. And this can be especially horrible because these can be things that never even happened. It results in endless cyclical arguments that never go anywhere, never get resolved, and never end because this person simply cannot let it go. You end up explaining yourself over and over again just to be asked the same questions or be accused of the same things over and over again. It doesn't get through. It never stops and it won't stop because not only do they need to blame you for things in order to avoid shame for themselves and not only do they want to punish you for supposedly hurting them as you have, they have some other very serious issues in this area. Pathologically narcissistic people are extremely rigid psychologically. They are inflexible and they have a very hard time integrating new data into their understanding of things. On top of suffering from a range of cognitive distortions, they enter into a state of cognitive fusion where thoughts, emotions, and experiences become fused together and then those become fixed in their minds. Their perception of reality and consequently their reactions and their behavior reflect this fused experience rather than the experience of the actual situation or the moment and they reject information that refutes or disproves the fused experience. Not just because they're psychologically rigid, 
but also because, as we discuss in Narcissists and Cognitive Distortions, their conclusions make sense to them. They might have been in this state of cognitive fusion for decades without ever questioning or even acknowledging it. Cognitive fusion and psychological inflexibility contribute to narcissists talking about the same things or asking the same questions over and over again as if they've never been discussed, even though they have, often multiple times. The inflexibility and subsequent rejection of new information is not just a result of these cognitive issues. They are also an automatic defense reaction because acceptance or consideration of the new information would cause narcissists to experience an unwanted or negative emotional event, such as being wrong. Being wrong might not sound so terrible to you, but to someone living in such a shame-based existence, it's very dangerous. Shame is a core component of the narcissistic personality. It is disproportionately strong and it can be triggered very easily. They spend their lives trying to outrun this shame and things like being wrong can cause a tidal wave of shame that they can't escape. This means there is a lot riding on not being wrong. This can be one of the reasons they tend not to learn from mistakes or failures and a big reason they are so resistant to skill-based therapies which could possibly help them with management of some things. Even for narcissists who can admit they have some problems, the idea that they must do something differently can be tantamount to having done something wrong. This makes it very difficult for narcissistic people to process events, particularly if they involve negative emotions. Because narcissists have such a tendency to automatically perceive things negatively, and because they will try to avoid negative emotional experiences at all costs, there are many things that happen which they are not able to process or accept. They can seem to move on from things quite easily, but that's often because they're not moving on from things. They are moving away from things, towards something, someone, or somewhere else. That's not moving on. It's escaping. We see this very clearly in the use of gaslighting and word salad, as well as projection, blame shifting, shame dumping, and virtually all of their other toxic behaviors. It's all about avoiding escaping potentially negative emotional experiences. Narcissistic people cannot process or hold negative emotions. They have to simply vent them out. This may release some of the pressure for them in the moment, but it does not address the emotion in any way. So it just sits there. This is why they still seem angry, upset, or hurt, or bothered by things for so long, even things that happened decades ago. In order to move on from things, you have to be able to process what happened and the emotions that came with it. Then you have to be able to accept it all. Narcissists don't do any of that, and consequently, they do not move on. They move away. It's important to remember, too, this overwhelmingly has to do with things narcissists believe have been done to them. Because they don't bond with other people, the loss of a relationship only seems to matter when they believe the other person did something to them, which is often. The relationship itself, though, is not the focus or the problem. It's what was done wrong to the narcissist. That is what they cannot move on from. This is, ironically, also why they move away so quickly from things they've done to other people. Being told they've done something wrong exposes narcissists, which triggers shame, not remorse. Shame and remorse are not the same thing. It triggers shame and must be avoided. The lack of ability to process negative emotions keeps them stuck in what they believe has been done to them, but it also allows them to move away from the things they've done to other people. This can be very confusing, but it can help to remember that in some ways, time has stopped for this person and will never move on, but in others, time is flying by too fast for them to even catch. When you don't process emotions, this keeps the situation fresh as if it just happened. At the same time, avoiding everything and just moving away from it can make events and experiences seem farther away than they really were. This results in sometimes talking about things from decades ago as if they just happened, but also talking about things as if they happened decades ago when they just happened. Their concept of time in this way can be very vague and seems often to be based on how emotionally impacted they were by something. If it has no emotional meaning for them, it seems to have no meaning at all. Hoovering, which is what it's called when narcissists try to suck people back into relationships, falls under this umbrella as well. Many times people believe hoovering is evidence that the narcissist cares about them. Look, they came back. Look, they're crying. Look, they are promising change. Look, they're apologizing. Look, they gave up that other relationship. Look, they made this big, huge, grandiose gesture. But once again, the narcissist is trying to avoid a negative emotional experience by re-securing the relationship. This is not evidence that they care about somebody. It's evidence that losing control over other people terrifies them because they're dependent on other people to survive.
In the end, dealing with a person who cannot move on is extremely difficult. There's no growth, there's no evolution, there's no second chance, there is only endless punishment and judgment. As we discussed in the episode of the show called The Loss is Permanent, there can be no change here. Whatever they think you did is etched in stone and will never wear off. It can't be forgiven. It does not decrease in severity over time. If anything, over time what you supposedly did may become worse, not better. That is, until someone else does something to them and they need you to be there for them again. Then it doesn't go away, but it matters less than their need to feel better. Until it doesn't again, of course. This is your only function in these relationships. You are a tool to help regulate their emotions. That hurts. It really does. But at least you will move on from that hurt eventually. They won't. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online over the phone via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, clinics, and seminars throughout the year. So if you're interested in seeing what we are running this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by betterhelp.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey, everybody. It's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today, I want to talk to you about something that is often misunderstood regarding narcissists, and that is that they are chronically miserable people. It's easy to believe that pathologically narcissistic people are skipping through life without a care in the world because many of them have no real empathy and no real remorse. Some don't even seem to have an understanding of the chaos and damage they have created, so they're certainly not bothered by guilt over their behavior. However much sense this makes, it's not quite the truth. This viewpoint assumes that other people besides the self are the only real source of unhappiness, and so if someone does not care that they've hurt other people, there's nothing else that could bother them. That's not reality. The truth is, other people are a source of pain, but we can be and often are hurt by things about or within ourselves. People sometimes make the mistake of believing that if someone has little or no empathy, they have no feelings. Empathy is the understanding and acknowledgement of other people's feelings. People sometimes assume that if someone does not understand the feelings of other people, it must be because they have no feelings of their own. This is not the case. For narcissists, the problem is not with the feelings part of this equation, it's with the other people part. Narcissists have feelings. They might not be able to identify or connect with them very well, but they do have them. They understand how it feels to be hurt. They don't understand the reality of other people's feelings. They may intentionally hurt others to make themselves feel better, but there doesn't seem to be any ability to understand what this actually and realistically means for the other person. It's about them. The feelings of others seem to be experienced in a very egocentric, even abstract way. They're not really perceived as reality. People sometimes assume that narcissistic people must have an understanding of emotions in order to manipulate other people. That isn't really true either. We often use the remote control metaphor here on this channel to describe how narcissists are able to manipulate people without having any true understanding of how or why that works. You know that if you press a button on a remote control, the device it's paired with will react in a certain way or do a certain thing. You probably don't know how it works and you don't need to know how it works to use it. This is how many narcissists use manipulation. To take that metaphor a step further, if the remote stopped working the way you wanted it to work, you might bang it on the coffee table or toss it across the room in frustration, but you wouldn't be doing that because you're trying to hurt the remote. That would require you first having an understanding of how the remote feels, and second, it would require the remote's feelings to cross your mind. That doesn't happen, though, because a remote has no feelings that you are aware of or that matter. The remote doesn't matter. It's just a convenient target. What matters is that you are frustrated and attacking this object makes you feel better. The manipulation from narcissists is all about the ego. It involves emotions because they provoke emotions by attacking the ego of the other person, their sense of self. They do this because their own ego is dysfunctional. It is both massive and fragile, which is a terrible combination. So easy to damage and so difficult to avoid. 
The pathologically narcissistic ego is beset by shame at every turn. Disproportionate, delusional, toxic shame is a core component of pathological narcissism. The grandiosity and egocentricity you see in these personalities is not just a function of arrested emotional development, it is a direct knee-jerk reaction to that toxic shame. Empathy is a function of maturity, and to say narcissists are immature is a drastic understatement. They simply did not reach the point in maturity where they can understand, care about, or even see the feelings of other people and have grown into functioning without it. While this ostensibly relieves them from remorse for their actions and the pain that empathy visits upon most human beings when we've hurt other people, it does not mean that nothing bothers them. They have many, many problems with themselves. That shame is just one of them. This is probably part of the reason empathy is so difficult for them. They're just trying to survive and they would not have any bandwidth left for other people even if they did understand. When people wonder if narcissists are happy, a question that might be considered is, do happy people do the things that narcissists do? The answer is no, they do not. Narcissists may appear to be happy, they might say that they're happy, they may show in public or on social media that they're happy, but so what? You already know they lie and that they put on an act. What makes anybody think that this would be different? Their behavior proves their public face is a lie. People who are happy do not do the things that narcissists do. They do not say the things that narcissists say. They do not believe the things that narcissists believe. People who are happy can love and trust and believe. They feel joy. They can accept themselves. They're not prisoners of paranoia and delusional fears that make no sense. They're not poisoned by toxic shame. They aren't jealous and petty. They don't need to ruin or sabotage other people or hurt them in order to feel better. They don't have to manipulate others in order to survive or trick other people in order to feel a sense of self-worth. They don't have to pretend to be somebody else. Do you know anybody who you believe to be a narcissist that fits that description? This is one of the reasons they're always ruining holidays, birthdays, vacations, special occasions. To us, they're ruining a good time, but in reality, they're not ruining good or pleasant times because for them it's already ruined. It's already unpleasant because they are always miserable. They seem to be envious that other people are not as miserable as they are and seem to legitimately want to ruin that. Misery loves company, and why should you get to be happy when I don't? Why should people like you when they don't like me? Why should you be comfortable if I'm not? Why should you be able to sleep if I can't sleep? Why should you be able to work if I can't work? It's like dealing with a cranky two-year-old. If they're not having fun, nobody is having fun because they will not allow it. The entire thing has to revolve around their feelings. If it doesn't, at the very least, they will behave so atrociously that no one can enjoy themselves, and at the very most, they will intentionally, purposefully punish everyone there for not caring. Not only does this help them to regulate themselves by venting the negative emotions they can't process or hold, it makes them feel better to ruin things for other people. This is the same mean satisfaction you see in a child who destroys another child's sandcastle because they believe it's better than theirs, or who breaks another child's toy because they can't have it. And of course, there are some people who are mean just because they like to be mean. They are miserable, nasty folks who get pleasure out of watching other people suffer and being as unhappy as they are. Narcissists also attempt to bond through negativity. This is another example that shows how miserable they really are. They attempt to bond by gossiping, complaining, gang-stalking, and acting like flying monkeys, sharing negative stories and anecdotes, attempting to rescue people who seem to need help, and preying on their vulnerability, or looking for sympathy by constantly claiming that they've been mistreated. Negativity actually seems to attract narcissists, as we discussed in a previous episode of the show, and commiseration is one of the ways they attempt to ingratiate themselves to other people. This is dangerous because... We have a human need for the support of other people, and because legitimately talking out your problems is not a bad thing. Because of this, narcissists can often take advantage of spaces like group therapy, addiction treatment, and other places where they can use this type of negativity as a tool with less risk of being rejected or being called out. When we look back at our relationships with narcissistic people, we might see that a lot of it revolved around this kind of toxic negativity. Some of the best conversations you have had with narcissists may have been when you were talking about something that you both dislike. Or you might find that the only time they ever really have anything to say is when it's gossip or a complaint or some other type of negativity. Happy people are not happy all the time, of course, but they don't feed off negativity. Narcissists seem to do that. 
when you start to outgrow this kind of relationship, you might notice that you no longer feel like you have very much in common with this type of person anymore. You have grown and matured, but they have not. In the end, we only have to look at their behavior to see that these are truly miserable personalities. They are bitter, angry, jealous, and afraid. They are petty, childish, spiteful, and vindictive. They are filled with toxic shame and drowning in pernicious self-loathing. They cannot bond, they cannot recognize, receive, or return love, and they feel violated by intimacy even though they crave it. They live in a world they perceive as chronically unsafe that they don't know how to navigate with no tools and no ability to acquire tools. They will never get what they want, they will never want what they have, they will never have what they need, and they don't know how to get it. The best they can do is put on these second-rate performances that stand up to no scrutiny at all and hope that someone is kind enough and good-hearted enough to oblige them. That isn't happiness. It's misery, and for them, it never ends. I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, seminars, and clinics several times throughout the year. So if you're interested in seeing what we're running this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. And if you're interested in joining our support group that meets several times monthly and includes a spot in monthly workshops, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and I just wanted to talk to you for a few minutes about trying to redeem yourself in the eyes of narcissistic people. When you are dealing with narcissists who are holding the past against you, remember two things. Number one, you cannot ever erase or unhappen things that are in the past. And number two, short of doing that, nothing is ever going to be good enough. Years can go by before you discover this. Years that you spend trying to explain, trying to be understood, trying to apologize, trying to move on, only to find that it's not possible. Any failure in the narcissist's eyes is permanent and irredeemable. It doesn't even have to have actually happened. Their belief that it did is all that's required. If you admit it, you're a bad person. If you deny it, you're a liar. There is no reasonable way to deal with this. There's no forgiveness, no empathy, no understanding, no consideration, no benefit of the doubt, no good faith, no redemption, no moving on. The loss is permanent. Relationships obviously cannot exist within this framework. People are not perfect. They will hurt each other sometimes. They will do or say the wrong thing sometimes. They will make mistakes sometimes. Narcissists simply cannot accept that. They are so fragile that not only is there no room for them to be a human being, there's no room for anybody else to be one either. Any deviation from perfection seems to be seen as a permanent failure. The fact that it could happen at all is evidence of how unsafe, unreliable, untrustworthy, etc. somebody is. This is unforgivable. No matter why it happened, no matter how long it's been. A side effect of this mindset can also be that the narcissist is unable to move on from some self-imposed shame regarding things that they have done, and they claim that you are the person who will not let it go. At any rate, stop trying to redeem yourself in the eyes of a narcissist. The loss is permanent. It cannot be repaired. It is a favorite claim of narcissists in general that some failure or lack or mistake on the part of the other person is responsible for the problems in the relationship. And if that person can just redeem themselves in the narcissist's eyes, everything will be okay. Many narcissistic personalities may actually really believe that. The problem is that it's not true. The deep, deep insecurity and pathological distrust that are inherent 
in this personality structure make intimacy and trust impossible for them. They don't seem to realize that, however, and they can't take ownership of it anyway. Most probably really do believe the problem is the other person or the other people. They may say all the right things, but when it comes down to it, they simply cannot or will not do the things necessary to trust other people and repair relationships. This is considered to be your problem. If you can't fix it and you can't fix how they feel about it, you're going to get what you deserve. If you don't believe that this is how it is, ask yourself a few questions. Has this ever worked before? Does this person seem to legitimately trust anybody? Have they ever done so? Does this person seem willing to give you the benefit of the doubt in any way? Are they approaching things from an open-minded place with good faith? Does this person seem able to understand and empathize with your mindset or your situation or anything about you? Is this person actually willing to forgive and move on? Are they capable of doing these things? Is this person more invested in punishing you or in understanding and resolving? Does this person accept your explanations, your reasons, etc.? Do they even listen to these things? Do they keep bringing something up no matter how long it has been, no matter how many times it has already been addressed? Make sure when you're looking at the answers to these questions, you are going off the person's actions, not their words. Many people say they are willing to do things, but their actions prove that they're really not. Many people say they trust others, but their actions prove that they really don't. Complicating this even further is the more a narcissistic person feels you're trying to convince them or change their mind, in essence, to manipulate them, the harder they are likely to resist and push back against what you're saying. When they don't feel you're trying to convince them, the more likely they are to believe that you don't care anymore and you're rejecting them and abandoning them. You cannot win here. This is unreasonable, illogical, and ridiculous. The more you try, the less they believe you. The less you try, the less they believe you. They don't believe you. Two plus two equals four, right? The basic thing here is that you should keep putting in all of this effort to convince them because it proves to them that they matter, even though the fact that you're trying so hard causes them to distrust your motives even more than they already do, and even though their contrary childish nature precludes them from even listening anyway. Most also have a deep-seated distrust. This often includes a fear of being controlled, manipulated, brainwashed, tricked, which makes considering anything anyone says almost impossible, especially if they're being contradicted. However, despite all of that, as soon as you stop trying to convince them, you may be immediately accused of not caring. This is not about you or what you are saying. So you have to get your mind around that fact. It's all about the attention and the focus and the energy you are pouring onto the narcissist in your attempts to get them to believe you, accept you, validate, whatever you're trying to do. That is what matters. What you want from them does not matter. It's not considered. It has not mattered. It will not matter, and you will not get it. What matters is you trying to get it. It is extreme effort that doesn't benefit you in any way. It's like being a hamster running on a wheel that is hooked up to a machine. Your energy is powering the machine and benefiting the people that are using that machine, but you are not getting anywhere, and you never will. So I hope that clears a few things up for you. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about something that a lot of people have trouble with when dealing with narcissistic personalities, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. It's very difficult for non-pathological people who have empathy to understand the way that a narcissistic personality operates. The way they think often makes no sense, and the way they perceive things makes even less sense. 
people often assume that the narcissistic person is the same as they are, but they just don't care. This is true in many situations, but it's also usually a lot more than that. To assume narcissists are the same as everyone else is making a fatal error in many regards. They are not. For example, as a person with empathy, the rights and perceptions and pain of other people are real to you. These things are a consideration in your decisions. It occurs to you to think about these things and they matter in your estimation. This is not how it seems to be for narcissistic people. Intellectually, they know that these things are things, but that knowledge alone is not enough to make them matter. It's not enough to make these things real. For many people, the suffering of people in other countries, for example, is similar. It is a thing, and intellectually most people know that, but unless they've seen it or experienced it firsthand, it may never really become real for them. That's why the TV commercials that ask you to send money to help the people in these countries show video and pictures of the people they're suffering. They do that to make it real for the people who aren't there or who haven't seen it so that they can connect to it and they can feel something. Due to their lack of empathy and some other issues, this is the same sort of abstract way narcissistic personalities seem to experience the perceptions, rights, and pain of other people. They know it's a thing, but it's not real to them, therefore it doesn't really matter. The lack of empathy is one of the things that prevents them from connecting with it and with other people in general. The idea that other people's pain or rights are real to narcissists and they are deliberately choosing to ignore their empathy has been gaining some traction lately. And because narcissism is a spectrum, it is true that many narcissistic people do have some actual empathy. However, if this is true, it's not just the pain of other people that narcissists are ignoring they would also have to be intentionally ignoring the cues we receive from empathy during regular interactions with people because many of them have extreme difficulty reading these things. Since this can lead to them making social blunders or engaging in inappropriate conversations or behavior and embarrassing themselves, it doesn't really make sense that they would do that on purpose. It seems more likely that for the narcissistic people who do have some semblance of actual empathy, survival mode just automatically switches it off. This would explain why they can appear to have some empathy in situations where they have nothing at stake or where there is no threat to them. We discussed this at length in the episode of the show entitled Through a Mirror Darkly, Pathological Narcissism and the Tragedy of Perception. It may be that the impact their actions have on other people in many situations simply does not occur to pathologically narcissistic people. They are thinking about themselves only. We assume that they've considered our feelings and dismissed them because how could they not? But the reality may be even worse than that. The reality may be that they did not dismiss our feelings about their behavior because it never even occurred to them to think about our feelings at all. Even when they are deliberately hurting other people, and many narcissistic personalities do do that, there still seems to be no actual understanding of the way this truly affects the other person at all. It's still all about them. The other person is just a convenient target. They are a tool that the narcissist is using to regulate themselves, and that's it. They don't seem to have any understanding of what they have actually done, and they don't seem to care because it doesn't matter. Their feelings are what is real to them. This is hard for people with empathy to understand because your empathy just is. You don't usually have to think about it. It's just there and you probably couldn't ignore it or somehow turn it off even if you tried. That may be why we have a tendency to think that it's that way for everybody. This does not seem to be the case. Narcissistic people genuinely don't seem to have that process and assuming that they have it but are ignoring it assumes they could stop ignoring it if they wanted to. <clears throat> and maybe some of them could. However, there are many, many examples of situations where pathologically narcissistic people legitimately do not seem to understand the feelings of other people or the impact that their behavior is going to have, even when it was to their own detriment. This, of course, does not track with ignoring empathy when it benefits them, because a lot of these situations don't benefit them. They are self-sabotaging. It's very hard to fake genuine confusion and genuine surprise. Narcissistic people may display both of these when being told that their actions have hurt or impacted other people. It might pass across their faces very quickly, but you can often see it in their eyes. They really don't seem to get it, and they usually have zero curiosity about it or any desire to learn more. They just want what they want, and they want to avoid negative emotional experiences because they can't tolerate them. The rest of it is just noise. It doesn't matter. 
It needs to be said, though, that even if this is the case, this does not excuse their behavior. They know that hurting other people is not okay. They don't need to care about that in order to know it or to be held responsible for their hurtful behavior. They do need to care about it in order to stop themselves from doing hurtful things, however, and this is where the problem lies. Your pain is not real to them, and because of that, they don't care about it. It doesn't matter. This is where understanding these kinds of things is really important. So much of the pain in these relationships is about trying to make your feelings and your rights and your perceptions real to the narcissist in your life and the hurt and the frustration you feel when you're not able to do that. The reality is narcissistic people do not understand the feelings of other people and it's not likely that they ever will. If you have to continuously reiterate to another adult person that you actually have feelings and rights and perceptions and that they actually do matter, this is a sign that this person probably really does not understand that or care. So it's probably not going to change. You do not have to tell a mature, healthy adult these things at all, let alone multiple times. Even most immature, unhealthy adults understand that. The fact that you do have to tell someone these things and then you have to remind them over and over again is a major red flag of a much, much bigger problem. It's hard to stop doing this. As a human being, you want to be understood and heard. The truth is, though, this person is not going to be able to do that for you. You're not looking for too much. You are looking for it from the wrong person. Accepting this is not easy, but it's necessary in order to be able to deal with the reality of these situations. When we can truly accept that this person cannot give us what we need, we can stop looking to them for it and stop feeling the crushing disappointment that comes from not getting it. We can talk about how unfair this can be, and that is a valid reaction that we need to acknowledge if we're having it, but at the same time, we have to try not to get too bogged down in that aspect of things because it's not gonna change anything. This is where practicing acceptance is really, really helpful and necessary. Acceptance helps us to remember that it is what it is, and whether or not somebody should do something has nothing to do with whether they will or not. This is one of the many reasons we recommend no contact. If you are going to be interacting with a narcissist on a regular basis, this is going to keep coming up. It's going to keep being a problem. As we discussed in the episode of the show entitled Narcissists Are Like a Magic Trick, your brain was designed in large part to rely on what your eyes and your ears tell it, and it will continue to do that even if this contradicts something that you know to be true. Being around narcissistic people can cause your eyes and your ears to disagree with your brain because what you see from the narcissist and what you know about the narcissist might not always coincide. This can make acceptance of things much more difficult because your brain feels like it's receiving contradicting, quote, evidence due to the narcissistic personality's ability to mimic and mirror how reasonably functioning adults behave. This means that if you know someone cannot understand your feelings or perception, yet you are interacting with them on a regular basis, you're probably going to keep trying to be heard and understood by them, only to run into this same brick wall every single time. This is torturous, and it's time to stop doing it. It's not easy, but it's so much better in the long run. If you find yourself explaining to the narcissist, remind yourself that you will have better success trying to explain the color blue to someone who was born with no eyes and stop explaining. Remind yourself that this person cannot hear what you're trying to say, but it doesn't matter because they don't need to acknowledge your feelings for your feelings to be valid, for your rights, for your perceptions to be valid. This is not easy, and you will feel discomfort over it, but it will pass. You're mature enough to tolerate discomfort, and remember, the discomfort you feel from that is nothing compared to the pain and the frustration of trying to explain and trying to be heard, only for it to go absolutely nowhere. Or worse, for it to be mocked, misunderstood, for it to be turned against you, for it to be turned around on you. This person simply does not have the context or the ability to understand what you're saying and they have no reason to care anyway. It's not real to them and you cannot make it real to them because nothing is real to them except what they want and how they feel in each single individual moment. If you cannot leave the situation or you're not ready to leave yet, remembering that can go a long way toward helping ease some of the terrible pain involved in these relationships. I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. 
I take appointments online over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, clinics, and seminars several times throughout the year. So if you're interested in seeing what we're running this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. And if you're interested in joining our support group with multiple monthly meetings, access to exclusive content, and a guaranteed spot in monthly workshops, you can do that on littleshaman.org as well. You've been listening to the meditations and more podcasts brought to you by betterhelp.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. May the great spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast, brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about something that often misleads people in narcissistic relationships, and that is that the most terrible thing about most narcissists is that they're not always terrible. It's very common to hear narcissists described as relentless monsters and evil manipulators, and they certainly can be, but they usually aren't always like that. If they were, dealing with these relationships would be much easier in many ways. For example, it would be easier to walk away from these relationships, because if the person were always terrible, then there would be nothing to stay around for. It wouldn't be so confusing. You wouldn't be so conflicted. This is perhaps the most hurtful, destructive aspect of these relationships because it gives people hope. When that hope gets ripped away from you, it's brutal. The fact that narcissists are not terrible all the time can seem like evidence that things are changing or that they're getting better. It is extremely misleading because it's not the end of the problem. It's part of it. The idealized devalue cycle is a hallmark of narcissistic relationships. Idealization is a period of time where the narcissistic personality believes that the other person is perfect, or at the very least, good with virtually no bad or negative qualities. Every motive that the person has is considered good and helpful. This period or stage is characterized by love bombing, putting you on a pedestal, trying to please you, or stating that you please them, basically behaving as if the relationship and or the partner is perfect or really special. When the narcissist's idealized version of us lines up with our ego's idealized version of ourselves, the potential for damage is huge when we inevitably fall from the pedestal. Devaluation is a period of time where the narcissistic personality believes the other person is irredeemably bad, with no good qualities whatsoever. Every motive is perceived as bad and harmful. It's characterized by accusations, attacks, and abuse. When the narcissist's devalued image of us lines up with the things our ego fears are true about ourselves or might be true about ourselves, the potential for damage is enormous because these are things we already have believe or think could be true, so they're easy to internalize as facts. If someone else sees it in us, we might think to ourselves, maybe it is true. This can be extremely damaging to someone's self-image. Now, we often hear these stages or periods talked about as if they happen in a linear progression. Idealize, devalue, discard. And sometimes they do. Sometimes a discard does follow the initial period of devaluation. However, what is also common is a vacillation between idealization and devaluation without a discard, where the relationship continues with the other person being alternately devalued and idealized based on the narcissist's perception of them and really nothing else. The perception can switch depending on the narcissist's interpretation of events that actually did happen or for no reason at all that you can really understand. It is this push-pull that is the reason these relationships can be so damaging and so difficult to leave. Not only does this create trauma bonding and addiction, if the relationship enters a period of devaluation and just stays there, people can understand that more easily than dealing with someone who is alternately loving and then cruel for what appears to be no logical reason. It's easier to forgive or look past horrible behavior when there is kind behavior to compare it against. Because the other person is blamed for the narcissist shift in perception, people often start to believe they can somehow fix this and the relationship will be good all the time. 
The idea that this is not possible or even realistic doesn't ever seem to occur in this situation. They either don't realize or don't want to admit that the idealization stage is not sustainable in any relationship no matter what because it's not reality. We have to be able to see people as they really are and accept them. If we can't, the relationship will not work. This is what happens with narcissists. They don't see people as they truly are. Whether for good or for bad, they are only ever reacting to a fantasy image of somebody that they have created in their mind. This is what the idealization and devaluation stages are about. They are not about you as a person. They are about the narcissistic personality's inability to hold one stable, cohesive image of a person in their mind. This is why, in a very sad case of irony, they will often accuse other people of having multiple personalities or of being like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The way they perceive you has changed, and now everything you do is being viewed through that lens. Yesterday it was okay to say this, now today it's not because now your motive is perceived as totally different based not on how you feel but on how they feel. It's not possible to argue with this or disprove this. As we have discussed in several episodes of the show, most recently the show entitled Narcissist and the Unfalsifiable Hypothesis, feelings are facts to a pathologically narcissistic personality. They are falling into a cognitive distortion that's called emotional reasoning, which means they believe their feelings are evidence of how things really are, even if there is no other evidence except for their feelings. I feel that you hate me, so it's a fact that you're feeling that. That's really how it is. I feel that you think I'm stupid, so it's a fact that you are thinking that. I think you're doing this. I feel that you're doing this. That means you are. Part of this kind of thinking is due to perception and cognitive biases in which the interpretation of events is faulty and skewed. Most prominent among these sort of cognitive biases in this situation would probably be confirmation bias, in which any information that doesn't validate what the person already believes is discarded, ignored, or reinterpreted to fit their perception. We can see this at work in another cognitive distortion that often goes hand in hand with emotional reasoning in narcissists, which is disqualifying the positive. When people disqualify the positive, they essentially reject evidence of positivity or positive experiences. They reject any information or experiences that reflect this, or they behave as if those don't count. It's black and white, sort of all or nothing, good or bad thinking without the good. It's a double standard in which all of the negative evidence or information counts, no matter how weak it is, but none of the positive evidence counts, no matter how strong it is. Though we certainly like it better when they are engaging in good or bad thinking without the bad, idealization, it's important to realize that this is not any better. It still isn't reality. It feels good, but it's not good for us or the relationship, and it doesn't last. As high as you go up on that pedestal, that's how far you will fall down when the crash comes, and it will come, because idealization is not sustainable. The important thing to remember is that narcissists are not usually people who are evil and horrible all the time. It can get like that, but it doesn't usually start that way. If we are only looking out for people who are evil and horrible all the time, we will be vulnerable to the many, many narcissistic personalities who don't present that way. They're not always greedy and stingy, or they're not always rude to the waiter. They don't all say hateful things to their mothers. They don't all cheat. They don't all refuse to apologize. Some do, but some don't. The ones that don't are not less narcissistic just because they don't. They have just learned different ways to behave. Many times people don't like to hear these kinds of things because it seems like it makes it more confusing and more difficult to tell who's a narcissist and who's not. But humans are complex. We're talking about the human personality. It can't really be laid out in a black and white fashion or listed like a recipe, even though that would certainly make it a lot easier. The truth is, it doesn't matter if someone is not terrible all the time. It doesn't even matter if they're a narcissist or not. What matters is if you want to deal with their behavior overall, if you feel good about the way the relationship is going and how this person treats you. If you don't, then whatever they are or are not doesn't really matter. 
I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, seminars, and clinics throughout the year, so if you're interested in seeing what we are running this month, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. And if you're interested in joining our support group with monthly meetings and a guaranteed spot in monthly workshops, you can do that on littleshaman.org as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by betterhelp.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and I just wanted to talk to you for a few minutes about trying to be seen and heard by the narcissistic people in your life. It's definitely a normal thing to want to be seen and heard by others. The problem comes when this person has made it clear that they do not see or hear you in a way that makes sense but you still keep trying. This is often related to an abandonment wound in someone's past and it feels very important to quote fix this by somehow convincing the other person to see you as you see yourself this is also an ego trauma because this kind of thing attacks your very sense of self it can be very very damaging unfortunately we see this in relationships with narcissists all the time. In fact, it's one of the things that can keep people stuck in the relationship, the desire to be seen and heard and understood by this person. I addressed it a bit in the videos called Stop Explaining to the Narcissist and Stop Defending Yourself to the Narcissist. The desire for someone to see you as you see yourself can be very strong. It can feel like a need. It can become disproportionately important in someone's life where they spend huge amounts of time and energy trying to convince the other person or people to see them as they see themselves. This feels like trying to prove your worth to the other person, but it's actually trying to get them to prove your worth to you by choosing you or by acting as you believe they should act or that they would act if they could see your worth. The truth is, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Their perception of you is about them, it's not about you. And we can't control the perceptions of other people. They are going to see us how they see us. And if their perception doesn't agree with the reality of the situation or the person, there's not a whole lot anybody can do about that except decide if they want that kind of person in their life or not. If reality doesn't speak for itself, Nothing you say is likely to make a difference. So before trying to explain something to someone, look past your desire to be seen, heard, and understood to evaluate if they actually can see, hear, and understand you. Because if they can't, you're wasting your time. Not only are you wasting your time, in most situations, it's really hurtful and stressful to try to be seen and heard and understood by somebody who's not willing or able to do that. Some people don't have any time or space for the feelings or problems of other people. They just don't. And wanting them to be able to do that for you does not make them willing or able to do it. Before investing energy and emotion into this, ask yourself if what you're expecting from this person is realistic. It may be reasonable, but that doesn't make it realistic. Just because something is the fair thing or the right thing doesn't mean that someone can or will do it. Our standards should be the same for everybody, but our expectations need to be based on the reality of how someone actually is, not how we want them to be, think they should be, or wish they were. If someone has repeatedly shown that they cannot or will not meet basic standards for respect, decency, communication, whatever, then expecting them to do better may be reasonable, but it's not realistic, right? Stop explaining yourself to people who are not listening, not considering, not objective, who are just looking for animation, excuse me, ammunition, or who just straight up don't care. You don't have to keep pouring your energy down that black hole. Learn to evaluate whether something is worthy expenditure of your energy. Many things are not. 
trying to be seen and heard and understood by someone who's not willing or capable of seeing, hearing, and understanding you is not a worthy expenditure of your energy. Your desire for something is not enough. The other person has to have a corresponding desire to give you what you want, and they have to have a corresponding ability to give it to you. If they don't, then they don't. It can be difficult at first to sit with the discomfort of not explaining, but it will pass. And the reduction of stress over time when you practice this and you do it whenever you should, you know, whenever you start walking away from situations where it's just pointless, the reduction of stress over time is so, so worth it. So I hope that clears a few things up for you. I take appointments one-on-one. -on -one, so if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops, clinics, and excuse me, seminars throughout the year as well. So if you're interested in checking out what we have running right now, you can do that. And we also have a support group and membership into that includes weekly support meetings, a support forum, weekly support email with access to exclusive content and a few other things. And you can also find that on littleshaman.org as well. Thank you very much for your comments, questions, and suggestions. I always look forward to those. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey, everybody. It's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to give kind of like a wake-up call for people in narcissistic relationships. So much of these relationships is fantasy and not just on the part of the narcissist. People around the narcissist are often utilizing fantasy too. Sometimes it coincides with the narcissist's fantasies and sometimes it doesn't, but either way, fantasy is usually a pretty large part of the dynamic of these relationships. The narcissist is using fantasy to pretend that they or their lives are something other than what they actually are. Reality is simply too difficult for this type of person to deal with in any way, so they don't. They pretend things are different than they really are, and they are often very, very good at that, denying things even in the face of actual proof and tangible evidence. It's a matter of survival. You bet they're good at it. People around the narcissist are often using fantasy for the same reason, survival in a situation where the reality is too difficult to deal with. Accepting the person or the situation for what they truly are will likely result in having to confront feelings they don't want to have, illusions they don't want to let go of, and actions they don't want to take. So they just don't. They rationalize, justify, excuse, or ignore these things until it's just not possible to do this anymore, and that day will come. The day will come when it's not possible to deny the reality of what the narcissist or the situation really is any longer. So if that day has not come for you yet, prepare for it because it will. And it can be devastating. Another name for fantasy in this case is denial. When someone is faced with evidence that something is true but they refuse to believe it or cannot see what it means, this is denial. Many people in narcissistic relationships are in deep denial about what's going on. There are definitely people who don't understand, but that's not what we're talking about. Denial is not simply not understanding. It is refusing to understand, even in the face of proof or evidence. Even if someone does not understand what a narcissist is, they still know, for example, that someone apologizing but never changing their behavior is not sorry or that someone who lies constantly is not honest and therefore cannot be trusted. It's important to understand that these fantasies contribute to cognitive dissonance, which is a huge factor in people feeling stuck in these relationships and unable to leave. The idea that things will someday change is extremely common in relationships with narcissists, as is the idea that somehow the people around the narcissist are going to be able to manage or control the narcissist and therefore change or fix them. Both of these things are fantasies. It's not possible to fix or change other people. They have to fix or change themselves if they have the capability to do so, and some people do not. 
people sometimes don't want to hear that or to believe it, but it's the reality. Some people do not have the ability to do the work. They just don't. The truth is reality is not always gentle with us. As unpleasant as it can be, we usually do not have the luxury of avoiding or denying it for very long. Reality has a way of coming through, whether we're ready for it or not, and learning to accept it as it is leads to less pain and stress in the end. When things are accepted as they are, it can hurt, but the pain only has to be faced one time. If we keep trying to deny or avoid the reality of a situation, we will be forced to face these things over and over again every time denial breaks down and reality reasserts itself. This is actually more painful in the end, not less, and it takes longer. There are many unpleasant truths that need to be faced about narcissistic relationships, and the sooner they are accepted, the faster people can begin to heal. One of the biggest things that needs to be faced by so many people is that your love is not going to heal this person, and it's not going to change the situation. There is often a powerful and pervasive fantasy for many people that one day the narcissist will see, their eyes will be open about how much has been given to them or sacrificed for them, and this will emotionally move them so much on such a deep level that they are going to change their behavior forever after. This is a favorite plot for media and movies, and narcissists may even claim that it's the truth, but it's not reality. People who cannot recognize love generally don't just suddenly figure that out. People who can understand love and respect are generally not abusers in the first place. Narcissists often claim that others are responsible for them and their behavior, so your love can change me and heal me and fix me is just another example of that. The idea that special love or repeated sacrifice and self-betrayal is going to one day touch this person so much that a lifetime of behavior and conditioning and thought processes and mindsets and justifications will simply change is just not realistic. It's not because you're not enough. It's not because your love is not enough. It's because their problems have nothing to do with you. You're probably not the only person who has ever tried to do this for them, regardless of what they say. It hasn't worked, and it won't work, because it can't work. You are not the exception, no matter what anybody says. It is only our egos that make us think we can be the exception, and this is ego involved, because it's one thing to want to help somebody. To believe you are the solution to their problems is something else. Another thing that really needs to be understood is that this is not going to change. Narcissistic relationships do not evolve or grow. They run through cycles and that's it. It can take a few years to be able to see the difference and until someone can see the whole thing, they may believe they are seeing legitimate change. However, if someone is pathologically narcissistic, this is very unlikely. They may do okay for a while in some different areas of their lives or with a relationship, but then they slide back into irresponsible, abusive, or more low-functioning types of behavior over and over and over. This can go on for years, even decades, with no true evolution or maturity happening at all. It's just the cycle. Just like the pattern of the relationship goes in a cycle, oftentimes the functioning of narcissists does too. It can be very difficult for people to understand that there can be a situation where someone just does not grow or change or learn, but these situations definitely do exist, and relationships that involve narcissists are often exactly these kinds of situations. As hard as it is to understand, there usually comes a point where it just cannot be denied. For example, when it's been 5 years, or 10 years, or 20 years, and this person still has not matured very much at all. They've not grown, they've not changed, they're still doing the same things, saying the same things, giving the same excuses, making the same mistakes over and over and over. In order to deal with the reality of these relationships, this must be understood because they don't change. Many times people attempt to deal with and survive this reality by believing that it'll be better in the future when some condition is met or some hurdle is jumped and this is supported completely by narcissists. That's what future faking is. The truth is this is how it is and how it will likely always be regardless of what happens because you're dealing with a personality that has been arrested at a certain level of maturity and a certain level of functioning that is now stuck in a loop. This is extremely hard to change. It may even be impossible, but it doesn't have to be your life.
you're actually standing in the future that you were hoping for, that you were promised three months ago or five years ago or one year ago. Does it look like you thought it would? Does it look like you were hoping it would or like you believed it would? It also needs to be understood that this person does not think like you or understand how you feel and they don't care. This is not something you can explain to them or make them understand. If you're dealing with a pathologically narcissistic person, you're dealing with significant and severe dysfunction. And some have such significant severe dysfunction that they qualify as clinically disordered. This is not something a person can just stop doing or just stop having. It doesn't excuse their behavior or their choices in any way because they know right from wrong. Even if they don't understand why something is considered wrong, they know that it's wrong. However, it does tell us that this is more than just a case of someone choosing harmful, inconsiderate, or inappropriate behavior. The people we are referring to when we use the word narcissist have a pathological personality, which means they have pathological thought processes, mindsets, behaviors, pathological emotional dysregulation. They generally lack empathy, lack impulse control, lack self-worth, and the ability to create or regulate self-worth. They have difficulty with object permanency, object constancy, whole object relations. There's usually a severe identity disturbance. This is a multifaceted problem that affects every part of their lives, whether you can see the effect or not. As hard as it is for you to try to understand what the mindset of a person like this might be like, that's the same difficulty they would have trying to understand where you're coming from, how you feel, what you're thinking. And that's if they bothered, which they probably wouldn't. It's not about not caring because this is beyond not caring. It's not even on their radar because nothing is on their radar but themselves. There's no room in their focus or in their lives for anyone else but them. What you think, what you want, what you like, what you care about, who you are as a person, none of this information even occurs to them as a thing, as existing. And if it's pointed out, none of it matters except for how it applies to or benefits them. They can't see it any other way. They have no real understanding either that this is different from how anybody else operates and they don't care because it doesn't matter. This is how they operate. They've likely never questioned or even considered it at all. Even if they did, it wouldn't change anything. You can't force someone to have feelings they don't have or stop seeing other people as objects. This is just how it is. You could maybe force someone to act like they have feelings they don't have, but an act is all it's ever going to be. It needs to be accepted as well that narcissists are dangerous, even if they do not have or do not appear to have consciously malicious motives. Dealing with narcissists is so damaging, even when people understand what's happening and are actively guarding against it. Even if there's no physical abuse or violence at all, even if there's no overt or purposeful mistreatment that you can recognize, dealing with someone who is relentlessly trying to force you to live in a reality that does not match your own is extremely harmful. Over time, it will affect you, sometimes very significantly. It will change your behavior. It will change your thoughts and thought processes. It will change your beliefs and mindsets. It will affect your faith in things. It will exhaust you. It will drag you down. It will cause health problems. People need to let go of the idea that they can become strong enough or educated enough or healthy enough to withstand or manage these relationships. Besides the reality that healthy people generally don't intentionally pursue relationships where they're continually neglected, mistreated, used, or devalued, no matter how healthy or strong you become, the narcissist remains the same. They do not change. In addition to these things, it's important to understand that you're dealing with a person who cannot bond with other people, cannot trust other people, and is pathologically insecure. Now, this is not the kind of insecurity people are talking about when they mean that somebody has low self-esteem, although that is also definitely a problem with narcissists too. This is insecurity on a fundamental level where somebody doesn't feel safe. They cannot bond or connect to other people, so they never get to know them, and they can't trust them no matter how long it's been. Those of you who have been in relationships with narcissists for years know that this is true. No matter what happens or what you do, they do not feel safe enough to trust you ever, even in basic ways. It often comes out as anger, accusation, avoidance, distance, contempt, and is generally framed in a way that makes it look like you're doing something wrong to make you untrustworthy, but this is the reality behind it. After all the years, all the pain and the abuse, 
after all the manipulation, after all the lies, after all of the horrible things, you will likely still have more basic trust in the narcissist as a human being than they have ever had in you. Ever. Think about that. Even the basic trust required to physically exist in the world with other people, they do not have in anybody, including themselves. The world is a battleground to them, an inherently unsafe place where everyone is not just not an ally, but an enemy, a potential life-threatening attacker. You cannot ever love someone like this enough to prove that you are safe enough for them to trust you. It can't happen because they don't know what safety is. They live in a world where there is no such thing and there never has been. Some narcissists may become super aggressive, dominant, and even violent in order to deal with that reality. Others may become helpless, vulnerable, and lost, and even still others may become ultra-controlled and flat emotionally with very little reaction to anything, but all of these are ways of dealing with the same fundamental problem. They believe the world is inherently unsafe, which influences their orientation to it and their interactions with it enormously. Whether it's a parent or an adult child or a friend or a partner, it's always the same. There is no future with these relationships. There's no trust or partnership with these relationships. There's no history, no equity built. There's no good faith with these relationships, no benefit of the doubt. There's no change, no evolution. You cannot communicate with this person. You're not going to be able to communicate with this person. You will not be heard. You will not matter. You will not be able to fix that. The narcissist is not going to wake up one day and realize they've been wrong for their entire lives. You are not going to be the exception that ends up happily ever after. The idea that the outcome will be different for us because we are different or our relationship is different is an ego story that really needs to be released because not only is it harmful, it's false. Sometimes we need to believe it so that we can survive and so that we can hold on to the hope that we're still going to get what we want in the end, that this is not all for nothing. It's not worth your health. The reality is, if any of this information resonates with you, then your relationship is obviously not different, and neither is the narcissist you're dealing with. Neither are you. The most important thing to accept and understand is that if you care about yourself, in all likelihood, you are eventually going to have to walk away from this relationship. It's not possible to love yourself and continually choose to be in a situation where you're being mistreated or devalued. Eventually, there will be a conflict that cannot be resolved in any other way. Eventually, the narcissist will do something that literally forces you to choose between your well-being and the relationship. It may not have happened yet, but it will. There comes a point where most people become simply too disgusted, too exhausted, and too aware of the reality of what's happening to do it anymore. There will come a point where you simply cannot convince yourself that you or that things or that the relationship are okay anymore. That is when the wake-up call becomes too loud to ignore. That's when it becomes too loud to mistake it for anything else. If you are hearing it now, remember where you're going may be uncertain, but it's still better than where you've been. I hope that clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, through messenger, and through Skype worldwide. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the book and appointment tab to do that. I teach workshops, seminars, and clinics throughout the year, so if you're interested in seeing what we're running right now, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by betterhelp.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you. Have a beautiful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about what narcissists are hiding. This is something a lot of people wonder about, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. Some of these things seem to actually contradict the narcissistic person's actions or their persona, but that's exactly the point. 
If you find these things hard to believe, it's just a testament to how good the narcissist act really can be. The first thing most narcissists are hiding is that they are having a lot of emotional trouble. People who are pathologically narcissistic generally have a lot of trouble with emotions, their own and the emotions of other people. They have trouble reading and recognizing them. They have trouble understanding them. They have trouble naming or defining them. They just have general trouble in this area. Many narcissistic people struggle with emotional regulation and they find their emotions scary or overwhelming. Others are so disconnected from them that they may be unaware they're even feeling them or what they mean. Many of the coping mechanisms we see in pathologically narcissistic people can be the result of these emotional troubles, such as projection, gaslighting, idealization, devaluing or discarding others, and more. For example, at the core of the pathologically narcissistic personality is deep-seated shame, and this drives an enormous amount of their behavior, often completely unbeknownst to them. This shame wears many masks, and it can look like many things, including rage, jealousy, envy, paranoia, self-aggrandizement, egotism, and more. When dealing with people who are truly narcissistic, it's important to remember that even though this person might be intelligent, well-spoken, and chronologically a grown-up, you are likely dealing with someone who is using a maladapted, dysfunctional adult version of the emotional coping and regulation skills of a toddler or an even younger child. This doesn't excuse their behavior in any way, but it can make it a little easier to understand. Another thing they're hiding is that they are not who they pretend to be, ever. At first glance, narcissistic people often present themselves as very different from who they really believe themselves to be. It's not a great act, nor is it capable of withstanding very much scrutiny at all, but it can be very misleading if someone is not looking closely or if they don't know what they're looking at. It's often said that narcissistic people tell on themselves, and this is true. But if you don't know what to look for, you might miss it. For example, the narcissist that is striving to come across as confident and self-assured can be very convincing. But if you pay attention, you'll notice there are holes in the performance. Because they're only pretending to be what they think is acceptable or admirable, they don't always get it right. They may be a little too braggadocious, a little too assertive, a little too self-assured. This overacting is very common regardless of what image they're trying to project. That's because this projected image is an overcompensation for the self-hatred, weakness, insecurity, helplessness, or whatever else that they feel that they're trying to hide. It's not genuine. So the helpless victim is a little too helpless or has a few too many hard luck stories. The happy-go-lucky person is a little too happy-go-lucky. The tough guy is a little too tough. The sensitive lover is a little too solicitous. These may, in fact, be actual facets of their personality, but they often seem overblown and superficial because they're being used as a diversion from other things, and in their own way, they are as over-the-top as all of the other facets of the narcissist's personality. Remember that people who truly have a quality don't have to try so hard to prove it to everybody else and make note of behavior that contradicts the image you're being presented. Someone who is happy and confident doesn't need to hurt other people when they get upset. They aren't jealous or envious. Someone who is in control and self-assured doesn't need to control other people. They don't need to play power games. In general, people who really are whatever narcissists are just pretending to be don't behave the way that narcissists behave. Another thing they're hiding is that they don't like themselves very much. Contrary to popular belief, narcissists are not overflowing with self-esteem. They are chronically self-focused and they are self-important, but that's not the same thing. When it comes to how they truly feel about themselves, narcissists are generally at the extreme low end of the spectrum. Pathological toxic narcissism is not the result of having too much self-esteem or self-worth. It's the result of having virtually none at all and no ability to create any. Pathologically narcissistic people are like very young children in this way. They rely on others to reflect who they are back to them because they lack the ability to form a true and stable self-concept on their own. The inability to do this is a pretty serious handicap for a human being, and it requires narcissists to use other people's reactions to them as a way to create some approximation of self-worth. 
This primitive survival mechanism is called mirroring and it's the main function of other people in a narcissist's life. Regardless of the relationship, doesn't matter, this is the main purpose of that relationship. Not only do pathologically narcissistic people have no self-worth to speak of, they're often consumed with self-hatred and shame surrounding who they are. This is what is behind all of their paranoia, jealousy, envy, rage, devaluation, discarding all of their false selves, and more. If you love yourself, if you truly love and accept yourself, you don't need to create a false self to show other people because you know that who you are is good enough. Once again, make note of behavior that contradicts the image you're being presented with. It can be hard to believe this sometimes, depending on the individual you might be dealing with, but that just shows how good this act really can be. Many of them are extremely adept at hiding this. They've had to be. This is how they've survived. And some are so disconnected from their inner landscape and from their feelings that they sincerely might not even realize this is the case. However, if we pay attention to the narcissist, to their behavior, to the things they say, and we understand what we're actually looking at, if we learn to see the misdirection and the misleading for what these things really are, it becomes impossible to miss. It's like pulling the curtain back on the little man behind the big head in the Wizard of Oz. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it, and the illusion does not work anymore. Another thing they're trying to hide is that they're afraid. When we observe the behavior of pathologically narcissistic people, we start to see something that they would probably rather we did not see, and that's fear. It can be hard to see at first sometimes, depending on how they react to things, but to the astute observer, it becomes very obvious after a while. Fear is one of the narcissistic person's biggest motivations, even if they don't realize that. Many people believe that one of their biggest motivations is power and control, and that's true on the surface, but what is behind the desire for power and control? What makes someone feel that they need this so badly? The answer is fear. Fear of being powerless, fear of being out of control, fear of not being able to meet their own needs, fear for their own survival. They also fear the huge amounts of deep-seated pathological shame that they are usually carrying around. This is often mistaken for remorse by the narcissist and the people around them, but it isn't. Remorse is for other people, and it's usually connected to empathy. Shame is for the self, and it's not connected to empathy in any way. It's all about them. It also usually has nothing to do with anything they've done. It might seem connected, but it's only connected on the surface. The thing they've been called out for is not the real focus, nor is the hurt they've caused the other person. Being called out triggers the shame of being thought of as a bad person who does bad things. It's another example of how horrible they are. This is the focus of the shame, and this thought process does not really address or even acknowledge the wrong that they've done to the other person at all, though this can be difficult to see at first. Their focus is on them, and it stays there. The shame experienced by truly narcissistic people is generally of tidal wave proportions and with no coping mechanisms to deal with it except their various manifestations of avoidance and denial, they live in fear of being unable to outrun this tidal wave one day. Many narcissists are actually afraid of other people too. They fear trusting anybody or caring about people. They fear allowing others to care about them. These, quote, good feelings inevitably trigger, quote, bad ones, and they are unable to deal with the emotional fallout and the confusion that follows. They enjoy somebody acting as if they care, but if someone says they care, they must be lying. If someone really does care, there must be something wrong with them. This seems to be experienced by narcissists as feelings for and opinions about the other person rather than as the self-hatred that it actually is and it's reacted to the same way. The other person is treated as the source of the confusion and they are blamed for that. Inside, the narcissist cannot understand or take ownership of their feelings and so they look around for ways that other people are causing them to feel the way that they do. Narcissists don't really understand how the world works, how other people operate, and most importantly, they don't understand how they themselves operate. So many of them are simply walking around imitating what they see others do to get their needs met and often making a big mess out of it because they don't really get it. 
They can't trust other people. They can't trust themselves. And they have nothing real to base anything on because of the instability of their identities. That's scary. Another thing pathologically narcissistic people are hiding is that they know something's wrong. Part of the reason that they're afraid and one of the biggest things they're hiding is the fact that they know, they are sure, they 100% believe that they are different from other people. Not just different, in fact, bad. One of the reasons the narcissist creates the false persona is because they are convinced that they are so unlovable and disgusting that they have to pretend to be somebody else in order to be accepted on any level. Many people think that that's true, that what they are hiding is their evil, abusive side, but that's actually not the case. The evil, abusive side is the second level of protection for what they are actually hiding. The weak, helpless, infantile core of unlovable, disgusting, horrible filth that they believe themselves to be. This goes way back to before they were ever abusive to anybody. This is very, very deep-seated. It doesn't have anything to do with anything they've actually done. Truly narcissistic people are the most self-loathing people on the planet, whether they act like that or not. The false persona exists for the same reason the abusive side exists. Both of these are reactions to needing to hide and protect who they really believe themselves to be. The false persona is the smiling greeter at the front door inviting you into the house and the abusive side is the 85-pound attack dog in front of all the doors in the house you're not allowed to go in. Both of these things are real in their own way, and both of them are also fake in their own way. All the sides that you see are actual parts of who they could have actually been if their identity was not fractured the way that it is. But they're not stable. What is behind all those guarded doors is as close to the real truth as you can get with a pathologically narcissistic person. And the majority of the time, it's not accessible. Not even to them. That attack dog doesn't just attack outsiders who try to get in those doors. It attacks the narcissist too. That's one of the reasons they are so miserable. And that is another thing they are hiding. They are very unhappy people. As you can see from this list, narcissistic people have a shot at being the most unhappy people on the planet. It's not a surprise. They are terrified, self-loathing people who have only rigid, maladaptive, primitive coping mechanisms to deal with the really serious problems that they're facing. Consequently, they become stuck in mindsets that are harmful, self-sabotaging, damaging to themselves and others, or unrealistic, but they don't realize that. Because they're so afraid and so avoidant, and because it is a pathology, they do not realize these things, and they continue to believe other people are simply spoiling it for them somehow, either for no reason or because the narcissist's self-hatred causes them to believe that everyone else hates them as well. This usually triggers massive anger, depression, resentment, and more on top of their already existing dysregulated or completely disowned emotions. None of this is a recipe for happiness. Pathologically narcissistic people are in a constant state of survival mode. And because of the rigidity, the fixed beliefs, and the inability to adapt, many have lost any capacity for true happiness if they ever had it at all. They seem to view themselves as helpless boats adrift on the sea of life, unable to do anything but react to what they perceive is being done to them. Even when they seem to be taking action, investigation usually shows us that they are actually reacting to their own emotions or beliefs, which they often interpret illogically as things that other people have done to them. Anyone would be unhappy with that mindset, and the rigidity of pathologically narcissistic traits makes it extremely difficult for this to be changed. The arrested emotional development that we usually see in this kind of personality makes it hard for them to even see any of this, let alone change it, and the maladaptive coping mechanisms cause them to perceive harmful intentions in anybody who tries to help. So there you have it. These are some of the biggest things that Dr. Jekyll is hiding. The important thing to remember is that by understanding what you're dealing with, you can better understand the reality of the situation, which is that this is a pathology. It's not your fault. It's not your responsibility to fix it. More than that, you don't have the ability to fix it. If someone has a life-threatening illness, for example, but they refuse to go to the doctor, you can't do anything about that decision. You can't do anything at all except decide how and if 
You want to move forward with the relationship. That is what educating yourself about this and understanding it helps you to do. Make informed decisions. That is how you empower yourself. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online via text, via email, through Skype, and over the phone. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. If you're interested in checking out any of the workshops that I teach a few times a month, you can do that on littleshaman.org as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by earthmamacbd.com and littleshaman.org. That's right, it's back. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by the Little Shaman. That's me. Today I wanted to talk to you about trauma bonds. Trauma bonds are exactly what they sound like. They are bonds formed by trauma and they are strong. As I stated in the recent episode of the show, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse, bonding is both a biological and emotional process, unlike love. Bonds don't fade over time. You can't fall out of bond the way you can fall out of love. Bonding survives even when you don't love the person anymore or even like them. These bonds have to be broken in order to move on and heal. It's very difficult to stay away from a person you have bonded with, which is why people stay in abusive relationships even after they know they should leave and even after they actually want to leave. It's a dirty trick, really. Love is easier to release than a trauma bond and an even dirtier trick. The longer a relationship involving a trauma bond goes on, the harder it is to leave. This is especially true when enmeshment occurs, which is the breakdown of boundaries between people. Enmeshment is when boundaries are so poor and so weak, people can't tell where they end and the other person begins. Trauma bonds are caused by inconsistency in relationships, such as love bombing, followed by abuse, followed by more love bombing, followed by more abuse. You know, that's inconsistency. It's like a roller coaster. It keeps people off balance and continuously looking for a way to get back to those initial good feelings. This type of dynamic occurs in relationships with narcissists, with alcoholics and drug addicts, and in abusive relationships in general. People who have grown up in an abusive environment are especially susceptible to this type of thing. It may be that along with or in place of the natural bonds that occur between a parent and a child, abused children develop trauma bonds with parents and as adults, without a trauma bond to their partner, they're unable to feel satisfied by the relationship. It doesn't feel like love without abuse, in other words, without that roller coaster. There is no understanding of peace without war, we could say. That's likely why we often see people who have narcissistic parents then go on to marry a narcissistic person. They've been conditioned that this is how relationships should feel, and that's not just a cognitive thing, it's not just a learned behavior. Trauma and upset causes hormones to be released in the body, like cortisol, adrenaline, you know. The honeymoon part of the relationship, where everything is nice, causes more hormones to be released, like dopamine. After years of being exposed to this pattern, your body starts to think that that's how it's supposed to be, and so does your mind. It doesn't really know anything else. You become, for all intents and purposes, addicted to the chemical dump, the excitement, and the drama. This cycle is sometimes called an arousal jag, and we do see that in narcissists. Quote, regular, as in non-abusive, relationships feel less intense and are therefore often experienced as boring, uninteresting, or shallow. It's kind of like the nice guys finish last scenario. After the trauma bond has been created, it feels like only the abusive person can feel that need, which is why it's so hard to stay away from that person. The excitement and intensity of this arousal jag is often mistaken for love. It is not. It's a chemical and emotional pattern your body became accustomed to and then dependent on as a result of abuse and inconsistency. It's about the cycle, not the person. This is one reason why being discarded by the narcissist is so painful. You're stuck in the war with no peace. You went up on the roller coaster and then you just stayed there. You got stuck there. There's no come down into the good feelings. And after years of conditioning, your body and mind believe they can't get along without it. Again, it's about addiction to the cycle, not the actual person themselves. There is often a lot of denial or misunderstanding involved in trauma bonds, but people can prove the reality to themselves by examining how they truly feel. 
A lot of times, upon examining their feelings honestly, realistically, and objectively, people find they don't actually love the person. They might find that because of the abuse, they don't respect this person, they don't trust them, they don't like very many things about them, they have nothing in common, they find this person's personality unpleasant, they don't like the way this person behaves. It isn't really possible to love someone you don't respect or trust, and many people find that what they thought was love actually isn't. They realize that it's only trauma bonds and conditioning that is keeping them in their relationship. This can be a very liberating realization. Once this is acknowledged, it's easier to address the problem of staying in the relationship even when you know it's unhealthy. And yes, that is a problem. It's interesting, too, that we always hear people in abusive relationships of all kinds think the abusive person is going to change. While that may be true sometimes or like at first, I think most people know inside that that's not true. They know the person isn't going to change. They may have fantasies or hopes of that, but realistically, I think most of them know that's not going to happen. They stay anyway, though, because their mind and body are addicted to that next honeymoon phase, the next dip of the roller coaster when everything feels good. The fantasies of change are often just a justification for staying. They're not the reason the person is staying. Once that truth is confronted, it's a lot easier to be honest with yourself about what's going on and why. This is important because it's absolutely necessary to break through the denial and the conditioning involved here if a trauma bond is going to be broken. If someone is harming you, if they are hitting you, if they are manipulating you, if they are setting you up in various situations, if they are attacking you without provocation, if they're destroying your peace, if they are undermining your confidence, if they are gaslighting you, if they are saying terrible things about you to your friends and your family, if they are accusing you day and night of crazy things, this person is abusing you. This needs to be faced, truly faced, if you're going to be able to understand the situation. Yes, it is abuse. Yes, it is as bad as it seems. Sometimes when people get used to something, they don't necessarily think it's as bad as it really is. But there's no excuse for it and nothing that makes it okay or acceptable. It doesn't matter if this person is nice sometimes. Ted Bundy worked out a suicide hotline saving lives, but I sure wouldn't recommend anybody go on a date with him. Anyone who abuses you does not love you, and you probably don't love them. Abuse destroys love, and it doesn't take that long either. You may have once loved them, but you likely don't anymore if the abuse has gone on for a long time. You may just be locked in a trauma bond with them, and they're just as addicted to the abusive cycle as you are. This is one reason they are constantly pulling at you with their siren songs of hope and change and love and all these things. It's not just their desire to control and their fear, though those things are part of it, it's their addiction to the cycle. This is also why the abused person gives in and stays or comes back after they've left. It isn't that they believe the abusive person's proclamations of change and remorse. It's the cycle. It's that feeling when the madness is over. It's the return of what feels like love. It's those good chemicals pumping through your brain. It's like a guy beating his head into the wall. Somebody comes up to him and says, why are you doing that? And the guy says, because it feels so good when I stop. That's the cycle. You're beating your head into the wall because you like the way it feels when you stop. Some signs you might have a trauma bond, besides recognizing the things I just said, would be the denial that we just talked about, where this person has failed to keep their promises or do what they've said, yet you continue to believe them. You feel stuck in the relationship and unable to detach from this person even though you don't want to be in it anymore or don't love or even like the person anymore. You have stayed in the relationship past the point where you consciously know you shouldn't have and the desire to reunite with this person feels irresistible when you do leave. It's so painful to you, it's like an amputation. Ending relationships is often painful, but if it's so painful that it feels like it's going to destroy you and you can't bear it, something's wrong with that. And let me say right here that although there are some similarities, trauma bonds are not codependency. They are a different dynamic. I just wanted to mention that before anybody asks me. No, they are not the same. The way to break a trauma bond is by consciously deciding to live in reality. It's about confronting your own denials and illusions. This means facing the truth of the situation, whatever that is, and no matter how hard it is. This person is abusive and they're not going to change. It doesn't matter if you hope they will or fantasize that they might. It doesn't matter if they promise to. They're not going to. Their motives, reasons, intentions, and excuses don't matter. It's not about them. It's about the truth. And the truth is, it isn't going to change. 
Another truth you may need to face could be the truth that you don't love this person anymore. It's almost certainly the truth that they don't love you and cannot be the person you need. It's okay to grieve these things. They need to be acknowledged and they're going to hurt because you're losing something that's valuable to you. Whether it was real, whether it wasn't, whether it's an illusion, it doesn't matter because it was important to you. But you can't let that stop you from facing these things down. It's only temporary. It's time to stop waiting and stop living on hope. Try to make an effort to live in real time. Feel how you feel now. This is affecting you now. It's hurting you now. It's affecting your family and your children or whoever else now. Don't let your mind just brush that off or deny it in favor of hopeful thoughts for the future. This is the future. This is the outcome of those same hopeful thoughts you had last week or last month or last year. How did that work out? Is it any different? In the same way, don't overburden yourself with thoughts of tomorrow. Just get through now. The idea of what you have to do or face tomorrow can be scary and it can be overwhelming. So live intentionally and focus on the present for now. It really is like breaking a drug addiction or an obsession. And the best way to do that is live one day at a time, making one choice at a time that works only in your best interest. For example, is it in your best interest to talk to this person? Regardless of how you feel, what does reality say? In another parallel to drug addiction, it's important to learn that the thing that makes you feel better temporarily is hurting you in the long run. Feelings are not permanent. They will change and you will feel better. Is giving in worth all the work you've done just for temporary relief? Relief that isn't even real and won't last? Evaluating things this way and practicing self-control goes a long way toward helping you stay on track and break away from the cycle. Because enmeshment often occurs with trauma bonds, it's very important to create and enforce strong boundaries. Boundaries are how we teach other people to respect us and how we respect ourselves. Examples of boundaries are, I will not deal with people who are disrespectful to me. Or, if my partner hits me, I will end the relationship. You can also create boundaries to reinforce self-respect and self-care, such as, I will remember that no one is perfect, or I will not blame others for things I am responsible for because I take ownership of my life and I am not helpless. Creating and enforcing strong boundaries goes a long way toward deciding what is the right thing to do. If it violates your boundary, then it's not the right thing to do. Breaking habits and changing patterns is hard, especially when there is a biological chemical component in the situation, but it's very possible. Journaling can help, writing your feelings down. It's important to acknowledge them. Yes, you might want to see this person. You might want to speak to them. That's normal in this situation, even if it doesn't seem to make any sense. So acknowledge all your feelings and get them out. You can also write down the fantasies and illusions you had about the relationship, then write down the reality. For example, fantasy, I thought we were going to get married. Reality, this person is a serial cheater and cannot commit to one relationship. Or, I thought if my partner loved me enough, they would stop abusing me. And the reality is, this person is abusive and does not understand love. Maybe you would say, I thought my mother would care more about me if I always did what she wanted. The reality is that my mother is a person who does not understand how to care about somebody or appreciate when they care about her. In this way, you drive the reality home to yourself so that denial and rationalizations cannot get a foothold in your thoughts. This is painful, but many times when you acknowledge and state these things out in the open and you stop ignoring them, the hope and illusions that you have carried around no longer have the power over you that they once did. Like they say, tell the truth and shame the devil. Trauma bonds take time to break as they took time to form, but don't get discouraged. Every day you can console yourself with the knowledge that what you are doing is right and healthy. The chemical component also takes time to break, but in time it can be repaired as well, especially when you learn to see these things for what they are so that you don't equate the intensity of trauma with the feeling of love anymore. It's up to you to break the cycle in your life so that you can stop engaging in relationships that are hurting you, destroying your peace, and undermining your self-worth. Once you've broken the trauma bond and begun to heal, you can look forward to the future and start building a healthier life with healthier focus and better connections. The cycle of trauma bonding becomes so ingrained in a person's life partly because of their inability to recognize what love is. That's not your fault, so it's time to fix it and stop using outdated programming that you don't need anymore. Start showing love to yourself and stop accepting less from others. You really do deserve better.
I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online and over the phone Monday through Friday, so if you're interested in speaking with me, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the Book an Appointment tab to go ahead and do that. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a few common behaviors of narcissists and why they do the things they do. Probably one of the most damaging and confusing things that narcissistic people do is projection. Projection is what it's called when a narcissistic person takes their feelings thoughts, actions, or beliefs, and says that someone else feels, thinks, does, or believes that way. For example, narcissists may accuse others of feeling jealous of them when, in reality, the narcissist is the one who feels jealous of other people. Or they may accuse others of thinking about stealing something when, in fact, it is they who are thinking about stealing it. This happens because narcissistic people cannot take ownership of these things. They project them outward onto their environment in an effort to disconnect from these things and disown them, usually because the things are upsetting or painful somehow. They then either experience these things as coming from other people and will state things like that they can feel the other person's feelings or that the other person's behavior points to these things being true, or they will recognize them as their own, but they believe the responsibility for them lies with other people. To that end, they will look around for ways that the other person is making them feel the way that they do, or making them think or act or believe the way that they are. It can get convoluted, but in its simplest form, projection looks like someone saying, I don't feel this way, I didn't do those things, I didn't say those things, it's you. This way, they don't have to face anything unpleasant about themselves, nor do they have to take responsibility for their thoughts, feelings, or actions. Blame shifting and shame dumping are directly related to projection. Projection is an unconscious defense mechanism designed to deny and disown things that are considered unacceptable about the self. Conscious projection is called lying. Because it's unconscious, trying to make someone see they are projecting can be very, very difficult. When someone is pathologically narcissistic, it can be impossible. Their lives depend on keeping this knowledge from themselves, so don't bother. The way to defeat projection is for you to understand what it is and why it's happening so that you don't take on responsibility that doesn't belong to you or allow yourself to be defined by things that aren't yours. Another common behavior of narcissistic people is gaslighting. Gaslighting is what it's called when someone tries to control or reframe another person's reality, whether this is conscious or unconscious. Intentional gaslighting is literally lying, and it's done with the intent to confuse the other person so that they will do what the narcissist wants, whatever that might be. For example, if a person is angry that the narcissist took something without asking, then the narcissist might say, oh no, 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 you told me I could have that, don't you remember? That's intentional gaslighting because the narcissist knows that this is not the truth. They're simply trying to escape the consequences of their behavior. The old movie that the name of this behavior was taken from is a perfect example as well. Among many other examples of deliberate gaslighting, the man was looking in the attic for the woman's jewelry and it was causing the gas lights to flicker. Every time she mentioned that, he said she was imagining it. This not only prevented her from discovering what he was doing and enforcing consequences, it made it easier for him to continue his behavior because she became confused about what reality really was. The villain in that movie was a very sophisticated psychopathic personality who waited years to enact an extremely well thought out plan to make this woman appear unstable so that he could assume power of attorney, have her committed, and then finally find the jewels that he had actually killed her aunt for years earlier. While deliberate campaigns of purposeful, intentional gaslighting such as the one depicted in the movie are not unheard of by any means, they're not the norm. Most experiences with intentional gaslighting are of the unsophisticated, defensive kind, where a person is simply denying that something happened or insisting that it did because they fear the consequences or because they're not going to get what they want if the truth is discovered. 
Gaslighting in general is a very immature behavior that is actually often seen in toddlers and small children. They don't have the wherewithal to defend, explain, or excuse their behavior, so they simply say it didn't happen. The motive behind gaslighting may sometimes point to more sophisticated kinds of thinking, such as we see in the movie Gaslight, but the behavior itself is actually not sophisticated at all. There's also unintentional gaslighting, which occurs because narcissistic people perceive things very differently than those who are not narcissists. They really believe things happened the way that they're saying they did, and if you attempt to interject facts or proof here, you may be accused of gaslighting. This behavior may not technically fall under the traditional definition of gaslighting because most sources define gaslighting as deliberate. But the behavior of asserting a different reality is experienced by the people around narcissists in the same way, whether it's intentional or not. The people around the narcissist have no way to know which is which, and to be honest, it really doesn't matter because the result is the same. The way to defeat gaslighting in the moment is to know that it's happening. Gaslighting that happens when someone can see through it is simply regarded as a childish, even ridiculous attempt to deny reality, as many of you already know. The only way gaslighting can work is if people do not trust themselves or their own perception. Working on building this up so that you're not vulnerable to gaslighting in the first place is the secret to defeating it long term. But remember, no one can stay strong forever. A rock will erode from a single drip over hundreds of years. In this same way, being around someone who is constantly trying to force you into a different reality than what you're experiencing will wear on you eventually, no matter how strong you are. Even if it never causes you to doubt your own reality or perception, it will affect you in other ways. Another very common behavior among narcissists is their reaction to splitting. Splitting is what it's called when narcissistic people change their opinion of something, including themselves, rapidly and completely. For example, one minute it's the greatest thing that ever happened to them, and the next it's the worst. These two opinions often seem completely unrelated. Nothing good translates or is remembered when they see something as all bad and vice versa. This behavior is caused by their challenges with whole object relations. They are not able to see the whole picture of something. They can only see things and people in black and white terms. It's either good or it's bad, and that's it. No gray area no middle ground, if you're not up, you're down, and that's that. Their reaction to a quick and complete change of opinion in the negative is often to behave abusively. Now that you are seen as all bad, you do nothing but bad, and you deserve nothing but bad things. The punishment for this fall from grace often has no limit, and it can go on for a very long time. In fact, the truth is, once you initially fall from grace in their eyes and reveal yourself as imperfect, often by simply witnessing a mistake on their part and realizing they are not perfect, the relationship has irrevocably changed and will never be the same again, ever. This is a sad reality for those who are still trying to get back to that initial good time and don't understand why they can't. Because you can never erase the fact that you're not perfect now and that you know they're not either. It's a done deal. They've been exposed as not the most perfect, valuable human being that ever lived, and by exposing them, you've exposed yourself. You've revealed yourself for the evil monster or manipulative trickster that you really are. They will never forget it, and many will never let you live it down. Now all the evidence stacks up on this side of things, and even the good things you try to do are viewed suspiciously or seen as bad somehow. You will not trick them again. Interestingly, they often still want to stay in the relationship even though all it really is now is one long punishment for your failure to be perfect. This doesn't always come out as rage or anger either. They may simply abandon the relationship or run to other people instead, trying to distract that wounded ego. They may say they've become bored, that you're not good enough for them any longer. No matter how it comes out, this behavior is upsetting and confusing, often because you don't realize what you've actually done wrong. They seem to have just changed their opinion of you for no reason, and often will not even explain. The whole situation is hurtful, and it's hard not to take it personally. However, it's not personal. Their behavior and change of opinion is not about you. It's about themselves and the shame that they're always trying to outrun. If this sounds unfair, that's because it is. But these relationships are truly parasitic in nature, in that the organic vehicle the parasite is using to sustain its own life, meaning you, is only important for that reason and no other. You matter as far as what you can do for them and in no other way. 
Manipulation is the only means through which narcissists can interact with other people and this is not going to change. The way to deal with splitting is to understand that it's not reality and it's not a reflection of who you are. It's not even about you. It's a reflection of the narcissist's inability to realistically comprehend a whole personality instead of just polarized, over-dramatized representations of parts of a personality. As with gaslighting, however, understand that it is not realistic to believe you can remain untouched by something like this. It's unrealistic to believe that you can deal with someone saying horrible, terrible, and untrue things about you on a regular basis without it eventually getting to you somehow. With all of the things that narcissists do, it's important to remember that dealing with our own stuff, our own triggers, and our own perspectives helps disempower and de-weaponize their toxic and abusive behaviors. However, it does not stop them, and it will not protect you from being affected by it in some way if it continues. This behavior is an environmental toxin that must be removed if you are going to be healthy. Think of it like being in a room with poison gas. When you're in the room breathing in the gas, you feel ill. When you leave the room and you breathe fresh air, you feel better. Your sickness disappears. Even if you become used to it, it's still there. It's still affecting you. On this show, we talk a lot about dealing with your own stuff, and dealing with your own stuff is absolutely imperative on top of being very empowering, but it does not, will not, and cannot make a relationship with an abuser healthy. While you're dealing with your own stuff, they're not dealing with theirs, and no matter how healthy, empowered, or strong you become, you simply cannot mitigate that fact. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype around the world. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the Book and Appointments tab to do that. I teach workshops, seminars, and clinics throughout the year and several times a month. So if you're interested in seeing what we're running at this time, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to The Meditation and more podcasts brought to you by BetterHelp.com and LittleShaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day.